الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا for everyone joining us for the 10th installment of Saviors of the Islamic Spirit today we will be covering the life of Nuruddin Zengdi rahmatullahi alayh and Salahuddin Al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayh without further ado Sheikh Saad Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana ila siratil mustaqim. Alhamdulillah alladhi khalaqal insan fi ahsani taqwim. Alhamdulillah alladhi 'allamana bil qalam وعلمنا القرآن وعلمنا الكلام والصلاة والسلام على سيد البشر والأنام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وعليه السلام <تصفيق> Today we go down a path in history that will make the COVID-19 situation seem like the common cold. And it will make all of our um, difficulties seem like nothing more than, you know, maybe a pesky insect that keeps flying around us. And that is, we're going to go into the age of the Crusades. And by going into the age of the Crusades, we're going to find one of the, mo- one of the darkest times in our deen and one of the greatest times in our deen. And the benefit of going through this conversation is that we can see that no matter how bad things are, they can always be worse. And no matter how bad things are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to take it out of that darkness and bring it into light. We can spend the entire evening just talking about what the crusades are and who the crusaders were. But I've already I had covered used two classes to cover Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi. And so we're going to have to add an extra session tomorrow to cover the last uh, the last um, savior within the text, uh, Izzuddin ibn Abdul Salam. And so long story short, I have to just move forward. The Crusades in our deen revolve around this, this battle that occurred, this prolonged battle between the Christian empire and the Muslim empire. Europe really had, and the, 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 the Christian empire had an issue with the Muslim empire. Ever since the time of the Prophet wasallam, the Muslim empire continued to grow and continued to grow and continued to grow and was knocking on the doors of the Christian empire. In fact, when you look at Tariq bin Ziyad, who's not mentioned here, Tariq bin Ziyad, who conquers Spain, when the Muslims then went through Spain and started pushing into uh, parts of Europe, they're on the door of France. And Charlemagne defeated them. Had Charlemagne not defeated the Muslims, there's almost no doubt that Europe would have become a Christian continent. Uh, sorry, a Muslim continent. And so you see that the Christian empire then had this issue with the Muslim expense. 
In part of the Muslim expanse, as early as the time of the, uh, the caliphate of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, had come into an area that all three monotheistic faiths used to claim for themselves. This is Philistine, Jerusalem, the Jews for themselves, the Temple of Solomon, the Christians claimed it for themselves, the birthplace of Isa alayhi and the Muslims claimed it for themselves. This is where the, uh, this is where the Dome of the Rock is. And so all three had claims for it themselves. The Muslims in the time of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu had, um, had uh, taken over this area and were now uh, the rulers, the conquerors of this area. And when they were there, many Christians began to uh, gather Um, am I back? Yeah. Okay. W at what part did I leave? You said the last word you said was when they began to gather. Oh, wow. That's, that's uh, I was talking for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. Um, uh, if it cuts out one more, once more, then we'll just stop. Uh, just because it's been cutting out all day. Um, my son's hips class kept cutting out. And already twice it's cut off today. Once before we join with everyone and once uh while well, with everyone and so uh if it cuts off once more then we might have to stop uh because I, I just can't guarantee if it's in keep going. i think it's just bad service today so anyway uh i have to backtrack what was i talking about um do you mind checking the mic real quick yes 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 no problem okay. did it switch over to the other mic no it's it's still the same mic okay Let me okay go. Is it is it better now or no? Yeah. Is it off? Should I raise the volume or anything? I think it's good now. Okay, cool. Okay. So let me see. Where was I? Okay. So the Christians had begun to gather and they began to uh, romanticize this idea of conquering uh, Jerusalem and getting it back. And as they began to, you had a lot of different Christians who made the effort in this. Uh, it's mentioned uh, Peter the Hermit, who was a wandering preacher, who was a very eloquent and moving speaker, began to go and bring... Um, I mind just calling into Zoom if it cuts out again? Yeah, I guess I can do that. Um, if I said no, then we'll, if I say I do mind, then what would happen? 
Okay. So um, they, 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 they began to um, gather. And so within two years, from 490 to 492, now 490 is when they began to march towards Syria. They began to march towards Shem. And this march of Christians towards Shem, of the Crusaders, let's put 490 into perspective. 490, that's going to be to only 20 years after uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jinani is, uh, is born. Only 20 years uh, after he's born. So if you want to put it in, in, in sort of um, in comparison to the timeline that we've been covering so far, that's, that's when this is all happening. Imam al Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he passes away in 505. So this is only, um, you know, uh, 15 years before his passing. So this is the time frame that we're, we're speaking about over here. And as they're marching, within, within two years, they are now um, uh, they are now taking over different capitals of the Muslim Empire, and by 492 they had taken possession of Jerusalem itself, the greater pa part of Palestine, Tripoli. They all fell into the hands of the Crusaders, and there's a historian named Stanley Lanepool who writes about Saladin, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi. And he describes this, and he describes that for a while it seemed to leave the cleave the trunk of the Mohammedan Empire into splinters, the way they drove through them. And when they captured Jerusalem, he mentions that the historians, not the Muslim historians, and I talk about the Muslim historians, even the non-Muslim historians, um, they themselves have uh, a lot. They're embarrassed to write about what happens. It mentions that th their own writers were ashamed to confess, yet unable to deny the savagery, the savagery, the savagery. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, and this is like pre-Wikipedia, right? In the Encyclopedia Brit Britannica, if you look up crusades, what do you find? This is non-Muslim writing over here. You find the following. So terrible is it said, was the carnage which followed that the horses of the crusaders who rode up to the mosque of Omar were knee deep in the stream of blood. Now, why, where did this blood come from? Infants were seized by the feet. Little children were seized by the feet and, 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 and dashed or bashed against the wall. Like their brains and their bodies were bashed in or whirled over the battlements while, and this is not only the Muslims. Now listen to what happened to the Christian, to the Jews while the Jews were all burnt alive in the synagogue. This was absolute savagery and disregard for the belief and faith of the other monotheistic religions. Muslims are being slaughtered and their blood is running, uh, flowing the streets. The Jews are being burnt alive. On the next day, the horrors of, uh, the horrors of which had proceeded were deliberately repeated on a larger scale. The, the leader, had given a guarantee of safety to 300 captives. In spite of, and he wanted to actually protect one of the leaders, one of the generals. He wanted to protect them. Despite this fact, they were all brought and they were all killed. And a massacre followed in which the bodies of men, women, and children were hacked until their fragments lay tossed together in heaps. The work of slaughter ended. The streets of the city were washed by Saracen prisoners. So over here, you're seeing exactly what happens is that they come in and their celebration is brutality. Their celebration is absolute brutality when it comes to taking over the, a land that they themselves deemed to be a land of God and a land of holiness. And at this point, the Muslims grow weak and the Muslims now um, are looking for some sort of savior. The, 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 the crusaders were so, um, they were so uh, motivated by what was happening that they had the intention. Reginald of Chatelon, he makes one intention. Revel of Chatelon, he makes the intention that he's going to go into Arabia and he's going to go and destroy Mecca. He's going to go into Medina to Manawara 
and he's going to unearth the body out of the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so Islam was really pushed to a point where it seemed like it can break. When we're talking about things going wrong, this is a point in which we're looking at people having deep fear of what's going to happen to the Muslim empire. What was happening within the Muslims? The Muslims, the different rulers were all fighting within themselves. There was infighting going on. And as a result, they were so busy within themselves that they could not turn their attention towards the greater th threat. There was no ruler after the death of Malik Shah, Malik Shah the last uh, great Saljuk ruler. A civil war broke out. In Stanley Lanepool, he writes, it was a time of uncertainty and hesitation of amazed attendance upon the dying struggles of a mighty empire. Chaos had ensued completely. And at this, po at this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought forth an individual by the name of Imad al-Din al-Zengi. Imad al-Din al-Zengi was an individual who was mentioned about him, a commander whose courage and military genius all must respect. And this individual, he started to march back against the Crusaders. The Sultan of the Seljuks, the Sultan Muhammad II, had confirmed upon him authority, and he was called the tutor of the princes. He began to march back against them. He came back. The Muslims had lost Edessa about, mm, about 40 years ago. He came and he took back Edessa. Then he went in. And he started to take over land after land after land. However, 541, one of his slaves had assassinated him. One, one of, um, by a slave assassinated him. And so that ended his, his time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not stop this effort. Now this is where we go to point number one. Point number one today is that all of us are special. And we have a place in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But no one is so special that Allah ta'ala's plan cannot function without him or her. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was said about uh, when he, when the claim went that he was killed in the battle of Uhud, which didn't happen, some sahaba, they sat down and said, you know, we can't. Other Sahaba made it clear that, you know, the Prophet may have passed away, but our responsibility is to fight for the Lord of the Prophet And even the verse that's revealed, The Messenger of Allah, Muhammad is only a messenger. Messengers came before him. If he dies, if he's killed, you turn back on your heels. Whoever turns back, turns ala aqibay upon his heels does not harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. And so what we see is that all of us have an important role, but in the end, our role is never such that nothing can survive without us. And why am I mentioning this? Because there is a balance between uh, confidence and humility. No one should be so humble and say, well, I'm nothing and I can't do anything, just sit in the corner. That's not beneficial to anyone. And no one should be so, uh, so that it's, it, 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 it transfers into a feeling of pride. No one should be there either. We should have this balance between confidence and humility. That we're humble, that this is only success will only come with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're confident that if he does grant us success, that nothing can stop us. This is why on the walls of the palaces of Muslim Spain, the Alhambra and other places, you'll see uh, La Ghaliba illallah. There's no one who will conquer except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in the end, there's only Allah who can grant any type of what? Success and any type of progress. So Nuruddin Zengi, he was the Sultan of Halab, of Aleppo. May Allah grant it success again. It's gone through very difficult times now. And he had always wanted to remove the crusaders from Syria and Palestine. And so now he begins to march. They capture Harim, which was one of the places where a lot of the crusaders had a stronghold. And then it's related that 10,000 crusaders were killed in this battle. And then soon 
they went further and further and further until uh, Nur al-Din Zangi was able now to, uh, let's see what standing Lane Paul writes, the possession of the Nile by Nur al-Din's general. Salah al-Din placed the kingdom Jerusalem as it were in a cleft stick squeezed on both sides by armies controlled by the same power. What does this mean? That Nur al-Din Zangi, he had come forth and after the fortress of, uh, of Philippi at the Mount of, of Herman, he, it fell before the arms of Nur al-Din. They all fell. On the other side was Egypt. The Muslims now encircling. And who had taken over Egypt on that side of the Nile? His, he had a general named Salah al-Din. And Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, now he and Nur al-Din are working together. And they had outmaneuvered the crusaders in Palestine. And now their goal was what? to drive out Palestine. However, Nur al-Din rahmatullahi alayhi, who is, I believe, a freed slave. My memory is slipping me right now. But Nur al-Din uh, al you have to remember about him. He was a tender-hearted individual. He was very soft in his heart. He was extremely pious and he was fearless. And he was nicknamed, even though his name is Mahmoud, that's his actual name. He was nicknamed Nur al-Din because he brought a light to the deen. Muntazm, one of the great uh, scholars, uh, Ibn al-Josi, who, who was a contemporary of Nur al-Din, writes of him in the book Muntazm that Nur al-Din marched upon the enemy at the frontiers of his domain and succeeded in gaining more than 50 towns from the enemies. He, he led a life better than most of the kings and sul sultans. Peace and tranquility reigned in his kingdom. Why did it reign? The reason why it reigned was because he was soft-hearted and he had lofty aspirations. And he was fearless of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the second point. When an individual becomes a person of piety, and this, I mentioned this about clothing a few days ago, it doesn't mean that they have to all of a sudden crumble and become a person who's completely limp and unmotivated. You see, people become pious Muslims, right? They start becoming, uh, going closer to Allah. They all of a sudden start what? Doing poorly in schoolwork and dressing shabbily. Right, Hamza Warsi, we wouldn't know about this, right? They start, you know, doing, uh, you know, poorly in school. I'm not saying he did. Uh, and they start dressing shabbily. And you know what happens? They now take away their own honor that Allah Ta'ala gave them. Rather, the person has to do is utilize all their strengths be beforehand. And with the combination of deen, make deen now flourish by a tawfiq of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Ibn Khalikan, uh, Khali he mentions that he was a just and pious king always eager to follow what Sharia had prescribed for him to do, always generous and he took care of the ulama. He was distinguished by his desire to take part in jihad and he spent a lot of his own wealth upon the poor and he set up madaris and systems of education all throughout Sham. His way was one that people could not emulate. Ibn, uh, Ibn uh, 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 al rahmatullahi he mentions what? I studied the careers of the rulers of the past, but accepting the first four rightly guided caliphs and Umm bin Abdulaziz, there's been no ruler so excellent in character and in the pursuit of justice as Nuruddin al-Zengi. So when we see this type of statement, we see that Allah Ta did not grant him victory mer merely because of the fact that he was a good warrior. There was a spiritual reality that propelled him forward. He also writes, he met his personal expenses from the property he had acquired out of the proceeds of his own share from the spoils of war. He had set apart three shops in, in Hems and accrued an annual rent of a certain amount. Once when his wife complained to him that the income from the shops was insufficient, he replied, I have nothing more to give you. Whatever else you see, I hold in trust for the Muslims and I'm no more than their trustee. I would not like to be consigned to hellfire for your sake by spending anything on ourselves out of the public funds. Who does this sound like? The same terms that Umar Abdul Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi would say. The same type of semantics and type of, you know, they had a shared vernacular. They would speak that same language of what? The wealth is Allah's. We're going to take what we need and leave the rest for the ummah. As Abu Bakr radiallahu used to do. It's further mentioned, he used to devote a greater part of his time after nightfall, after Isha, in prayers and had a regiment of remembrance that was set for him. Meaning what? He would do his wird, his dhikr, his Quran, and his tahajjud. He's a scholar of the Hanafi school. 
but was not blindly zealous, meaning he was a Hanafi. And you know, that's part of his greatness. And then, but aside from that, he was not blindly zealous. He, where he didn't claim that the Ahnaf were the greatest and no one else had any value and worth. He, didn't, he wasn't like that. And studied hadith, which he transmitted for the sake of reward and ijazah. He was distinguished by his remarkable love for justice, which could be seen, for example, in the fact that he had abolished all customs, all dues, all taxes throughout his kingdom. The rulers used to put this into place so they can gain money. He had abolished all of it. Once he was summoned to appear before a court, he sent the word to the judge that no preferential treatment should be accorded to him when he appeared before the judge as a defendant. Although he won the case against the plaintiff, he gave up his claim in favor of his opponent, saying, I'd already decided to do so, but I thought that perhaps my vanity wanted me to avoid attending the court of law, so I decided to appear before the court and now give up what has been signed in my favor. What does this mean? This means that what? He was called for a case, he didn't want to not show up because they would seem like, oh, he's the king and he doesn't have to show up. So he showed up and he won. Even though he gave instruction, be fair. And once he won, he said, what? Just give it to him. Don't give it to me. I just wanted to make sure that nothing wrong happens in this entire process. Battle, his valor, won everyone's admiration. He always took two bows and quivers to the battlefield. Once someone said to him, for Allah's sake, don't expose yourself as well as Islam to danger. Who is Mahmoud Nuruddin said that you speak thus of him? Who defended the country in Islam before me? Verily, there's no defender except for Allah. Meaning when they would say that, you know, hi, don't, don't put yourself in the thick of things. You might die in Islam and be compromised. What did he say? The same thing that Khalid and Walid used to say. Victory is not through me. It's through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these were practices of piety that he took from the earlier generations. Um... And so Nuruddin Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he really wanted to conquer, retake back Jerusalem. In 558, he suffered, de- he, he, he was actually defeated or minor setback, defeat at Hisnud Akrad, where he was taken unaware by the Christians. So he made a camp at Hims, a few miles away from the enemy. Some of the well wishers advised Nuruddin not to remain so near to the enemy after suffering defeat. Nuruddin, what did he say to them? He said, stay quiet. I wouldn't care about the enemy if I had only a thousand horses with me. By Allah, I will not go under a roof until I have the revenge of the enemy. After this defeat, Nuruddin continued his generous grants to the learned and the poor and the pious. Understand what this means. When it's suggested to him that he amount only a certain, he, 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 he keep a certain amount for that donation and the rest he should put towards jihad. What was it he say? He said, I hope for the support of Allah only on account of their pleasure and prayers. Meaning what? These individuals, they're teaching and they're praying and they're worshiping. If they gain Allah's pleasure, then we'll be given victory. See, he's not attributing things to himself, which is a very, and it's not a lesson, but sort of like a pseudo lesson you could take from this, that he was very quick to always give credit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentioned the hadith that says, Allah causes sustenance and assistance to come down to the earth through the poor and the oppressed. Who does this sound like? Abdul Qadir al Janani, rahmatullahi alayhi, that we turn to the people who are mazloom and we give them hope. They make dua, we gain success and victory. How can I stop from helping those who fight for me when I am fast asleep? SubhanAllah. While I am asleep, they are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lo, they never miss their targets. Yet you want me to help those who fight only when they see me in their midst in the battlefield and they often succeed or fail in their own endeavors. The poor have a right from the public wealth as much as they do. How can I not provide it to them? So, and then he prepared and he prepared and he prepared to go and, and take back his loss. And Nuru Dino Zang, rahmatullahi alayhi, um, in one of his battles in the siege of, uh, of Banyas, he actually lost his eye in battle. And when he met his brother, he said, if you only knew the reward of losing your eye, you would wish to lose the other one too. Sorry, um, uh, Nusrat al-Din. Nur al-Din Zangi's brother lost his eye. So Nur al-Din's brother, Nusrat al-Din, in this battle lost his eye and he met Nur al-Din Zangi. And when he met him, Nur al-Din looked at him and had no pity. He said, that eye, if you knew the reward, 
you would wish this eye went as well. Then Nuruddin Zayn rahmatullahi alayhi when he passes away, he has a general by the name of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi. Now Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi, um, he was called Ayyubi not because he was from the lineage of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. Rather, he was Ayyubi because of his father Ayyub. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is that their grandfather had my, you know, we don't have time for this, but if you actually look at the, uh, what happened, uh, Salahuddin al Ayyub and how he sort of, his father, and they all come into his position of this leadership, it's worth the read. Let's just move forward. He was a Kurdish youth, didn't have that much. Um, he was um, a person who Stan Lanepool mentions as the favored governor's son. He naturally enjoyed a, a, a privileged position. Um, and you might say, well, I just mentioned that he didn't have that much. You have to sort of understand like where he was and where he came to. What is was and what the position his father was given. Uh, pretty much you should know that um, when his father was given a position of government, now he became a son of a governor. And uh, far from exhibiting any symptoms of future greatness, he was, you know, he didn't show like he's going to become someone special. And this is now where we get to something very, very interesting. And it's our next point. Sometimes we put all of our hopes into the people that are showing potential without recognizing that's Allah who gives victory and success. You know, um, Omar ibn Abdulaziz, some of the historians mention that he didn't show that much potential. If the world gave up on him, we would not have had Umar ibn Aziz rahmatullahi alayhi. The Prophet وسلم, he was what? He was an orphan. He was an orphan from a community that did not give much care toward those individuals who's, who are orphans. And what's the proof of this? Halima Sa'a, when she came to go take um, the Prophet uh, to find a child to be able to nurse and raise it with Banu Sa'ad, everyone from her community, what did they do? They overlooked the Prophet in them. Why? Well, he's a child of an orphan, not going to have much wealth. You know, this is sometimes you see a person, but we have to always put faith and confidence that no matter who is there, Allah can always change their lot. And this is evident in Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu, who was he? He was someone who the historians write that had it not been for Islam, he would not have become something special. He may have even caught, taken his own life accidentally through excessive drinking because he used to drink quite a bit before Islam. So what do we see that we see that we never pass judgment on people. Yes, some people may have potential, but in the end, we never pass judgment. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides who will have greatness and you never know and I never know when someone will have that dua that their parents made, that dua that their teachers made, or the dua that they themselves made that will also be accepted and they'll be propelled into greatness. Sa'ad the zani rahmatullahi alayhi. Who was, if you read Shahr al-Aqa'id, uh, he wrote in other texts as well, obviously, great scholar. And he's, he wasn't just great because he's an awesome name. Sa'ad al-Din al-Taftazani, rahmatullah alayhi, he had tried, he was one of those students in Madrasa that when they would see him, they would be embarrassed about him. And the teachers were just hoping that maybe he can pass and he can just, you know, maybe teach uh, some basics or he can just get by with some job, etc. Like they were not sure what to do. And Saaduddin Ahmad, he tried, but he just did not have the intellectual capacity. One night he uh, was weeping and he fell asleep. The Prophet وسلم, um, visited him and I believe he placed honey in his mouth. I can't remember the exact story right now. Saaduddin Ahmad, the next morning, woke up with this prophetic influence within him. He went to Aqidah, he went to class, and I believe it was Kalam. And they were discussing an issue that was difficult even for the teacher to respond. So he asked that anyone know, uh, anyone have any comments on this? Anyone can answer this question? And no one was raising their hand. None of the intelligent top of those, uh, class students were raising their hand. Saaduddin Taftazani, rahmatullah he raised his hand. And the teacher was trying to just look past him, like, oh, anyone else, anyone else, anyone else? And no one was raising their hand. So finally, he had to call on Saaduddin. And he was just waiting for that foolish comments. And what, is ha what, what happens? Saaduddin Taftazani, rahmatullah he answers the question with such brilliance and eloquence and such accuracy that the teacher is amazed. And how did you know this? So Saadi Rahmatullah then mentions that the Prophet visited my dream 
And what did he do? He then, well, I forgot exactly what he did. And then that's, from then on, Saadi rahmatullahi alayhi, he was changed forever. And so what we notice is that we never give up hope on anyone. Even the drunkard, you don't give hope on them. The kafir, you don't give hope up on them. The mushrik, you don't give hope up on, the, on them. Why? Eventually, they can all turn back by Allah's tawfiq. So, yes, he may not have shown as much promise. However, Allah willed for him to become someone great. And so, Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullah his, uh, um, um, his, 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 his commander, uh, Nuruddin al Zang rahmatullah alayhi, it was, he told him to go towards Egypt. Now, Salahuddin Ayyubi rahmatullah alayhi had like a mentor that he used to look up to. His name was Qadi Bahaduddin al Shaddad. And Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi had written that, the, um, that I, I was sent against my own will to Egypt. And so uh, uh, Baha, uh, Sheikh Bahauddin, he responded by saying, Asa, he quoted the verse, Asa an wa huwa khayrun lakum. that maybe you hate something and it's better for you. And so Salahuddin Rahmatullahi Alayhi, when he came to Egypt and he was given that victory, this was what was needed for him to change his life. And this comes to the next lesson. So many times there are incidents that occur in our lives. We don't know the gravity of that incident, but it's through that incident our life changes forever. Personally, I remember when my roommate passed away in my arms in Madrasa, that's what really changed my life towards uh, trying to grow closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That change occurred with the death and passing of my roommate. It was something I didn't want to experience. No one wants to experience that. However, that experience is what changes my life, changed my life, inshallah, for the better. I mentioned this why. We should never think, oh, why is this happening, etc. Allah knows it's happening. Why is COVID happening? Why are we locked up? Well, maybe you're praying more prayers now than ever before. Maybe you're spending time with your family now uh, uh, more than ever before. Maybe your children seeing you pray are now motivated to pray, and they in the future will become the ones who guide others to pray. We don't know. So we have to look at every opportunity and embrace it. If it's something that's bad, we embrace the good that'll come from it. If it's something that's good, we hope for further good from it. So uh, Ibn Shaddad, he mentions that no sooner that he assumed leadership of Egypt, that the world and its pleasure lost all significance in his eyes. With a heartfelt sense of gratitude for the favor Allah gave him, he repented from drinking, renounced the temptations of pleasure, and took to a life of sweat and toil, which increased with the passage of time. Stan Lanepool also writes something similar. On his site, he says Saladin, Saladin, began to order his life more rigorously. Devout as he had always shown himself, he became even more strict and austere. He put aside the thought of pleasure and the love of ease, adopted a Spartan rule, and set it as an example to his troops, he devoted all his energies henceforth to one great object, to found a Muslim empire strong enough to drive away the disbelievers. When God gave me the land of Egypt, he said, I was sure that he meant Palestine for me also. And this is the next lesson. You know, you have these individuals who their lofty ambitions and aspirations and goals are always measured by their opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions in the hadith that Allah himself says, Ana in the dhanni abdi bi. That I am the opinion of my, that, that I'm in the opinion that my servant has of me. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he mentions this hadith that Allah ta'ala says that whatever, however my servant thinks of me, that's how I am with him. And so, if you look at people like, um, Abu Ayyub al Ansari radiallahu anhu. You like individual Sultan Muhammad, uh, Sultan al uh, Muhammad al Fatih. Who were these individuals? Abu Ayyub al was a Sahabi of the Prophet. So let's just put him aside for now. Sultan Muhammad, who was he? So Muhammad al Fatih, as we call him, al Fatih, the one who conquers Constantinople, he heard the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that spoke in praise, Ni'mun Amir and Ni'mun Jaish, the ones who conquer, conquer Constantinople, excuse me. Uh, that they are the from the best uh, leaders and the best army. And he then had a desire, I want to be from those people. Salahuddin, he gets Egypt. He didn't say, now nah, I got Egypt, let me relax. 
He thinks, if Allah gave me this, what more can he have in store for me? And this is what we should think. We should finish our prayer and we should think, subhanAllah, Allah let me pray 20 rakah of, uh, of tarawih. I have full faith that Allah wants for me to pray tahajjud at night after Ramadan. If we give charity, you know, a dollar in charity, we say, subhanAllah, Allah let me part from a dollar. I have full faith that he wants me to become the next Uthman bin Affan of our ummah. If we, you know, whatever the case may be, you graduate Sunday school, you pass a grade in Sunday school, and you think, subhanAllah, Allah let me pass Sunday school, win first place in the speech competition, or be part of the, you know, the 11 surah club or the 24 surah club. Those of you who in the MCC know what I'm talking about. You should think, subhanAllah, maybe Allah wants me to become hafiz. Allah wants me to become alim. We should have that hope in Allah Ta'ala. We shouldn't just think, oh, well, I did it. I reached the 24 Surah Club. I reached the top of my school's, uh, you know, list. I don't know if that still exists in MCC or not. That's it. I'm good. I'm going to relax now. No one should do that. That's the opposite of what the purpose of these types of recognitions are. And Salahuddin Ayyubi Rahmatullah this is exactly what he did. Now, after this, he became very enthusiastic for, uh, for, for striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al-Shaddad, Ibn Shaddad, his, uh, his, um, his mentor or his advisor, I should say, he said that fired with enthusiasm to wage war against the crusaders, jihad became his favorite topic of discussion. Always seen making preparations for strengthening his forces and seeking out men and materials and paying attention to anyone who spoke about jihad, he glad, gladly abandoned his hearth and home, family and children. He took to the life of the camp where a wind could uproot his tent Anybody encouraging him in his ambitions could easily win his respect. Now, this is the next lesson. Sometimes we strive for something, and what do we do? We make a, you know, very, you know, we're in debt, for example. So we get like a second job, and we're like, okay, you know what? I, or we get a first job for that matter. And then after like a few months, like, you know, I'm trying to pay off this debt. This is impossible. Where's the effort? That's not considered effort. Someone says, you know what? I'm motivated now to become a physician. And then they go to one science class in college. And like, that's it. I'm done. No more, sci no more be becoming a doctor for me. That's not effort. Effort is when you're convinced that something is great and worth it. You put all of your time into it. And this is why the believer puts all of his or her time towards Jannah. Now, that happens through different capacities, through the family, through work, through school, through education, through, through dean, etc. It happens through all these different types of means. But the reality is that we cannot, we cannot claim that, you know what, I tried my best, I tried my hardest. If we just make some sort of simple effort towards something, it doesn't work, then we just give up all of a sudden. No one does that. No one gains success through that. No one gained success through that. And so Salahuddin, rahmatullahi alayhi, he began to put all of his effort towards jihad. And Allah then began to give him openings. So what type of openings does he get? The battle of Hid, um, it's mentioned that how did Salahuddin uh, al Ayyubi appear on the battlefield? Uh, Ibn Shaddad writes, that he looked like a mother uh, who lost her only son, or her only child at death. He would trot back and forth, one end of the battlefield uh, on the horses, t telling everyone to fight for the sake of Allah. He himself would go uh, around to different uh, groups of the, battle, of, of, of the military and he would have tears in his eyes. And he would ask for people to come and aid Islam. And so um, um, it's mentioned over here, that except for a sweet drink on which the physician insisted, Salahuddin Rahmatullah did not eat anything the entire day. The royal physician told me that the, the Sultan had only taken a few morsels of food from Friday to Sunday because he was unable to pay attention to anything but what was happening in the battlefield. This is focused on something. So in the Battle of Hittin, what happens that after a series of fights, uh, hotly contested, what happens um, beneath the by Hittin? Um, it gave a death blow to the power of the crusaders. Stan Lanepool writes, the flower of chivalry was taken. The king of Jerusalem um, and his brother, Reginald, remember Reginald from before, and Jocelyn and Humphrey, the masters of the temple and hospital, and many other nobles were among the prisoners. The rest of the chivalry of Palestine was under Muslim control. Of the rank and file, 
all who were alive were made prisoners. A single Saracen, which is a Muslim, was seen dragging some 30 Christians he had himself taken and tied together. The dead lay in heaps like stones upon stones among broken, broken crosses, etc., etc. The long field bore the marks of the bloody fight. 30,000 uh, of the uh, crusaders had died that day. Now, what happens? Now, if you remember, who was Reginald of Shatzlon? He was the one who said, I am going to go and I am going to uh, go to Mecca, destroy Mecca, go to Medina, take the Prophet's uh, body out of the grave. So Salahuddin, rahmatullahi alayhi, he was fair and just. But at the same time, he had ghira of the deen. He had honor for the deen. So uh, uh, Lane Poole writes, the Salahuddin camped in the battlefield. When his tent was pitched, he ordered the prisoners to be brought before him. The king of Jerusalem and Reginald were both, 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 both brought. Sorry, both brought. He received in his tent, he, uh, he seated the king near himself. And seeing the king be thirsty, he gave him a cup of water, iced in snow, cold water. The king drank the cup and he passed it over to whom? To Reginald of Shatzalan. Sahadina Ayubi got upset. He told the interpreter, tell the king that it was he, not I, that gave the uh, gave uh, uh, Reginald drink. Why? When you give drink, you're showing respect and honor, but you're also showing what? You're showing that this person is protected now. You're under my protection. And he did not want to make that claim against Reginald the Chatelain. Then he rose and confronted Reginald, who's still standing. He said, twice have I sworn to kill him. Once when he sought to invade the holy cities, and once when he took the caravan by treachery. And what happened in this is that the pilgrims, that there were Muslims who were traveling for Hajj and Reginald attacked them. And the people who were attacked, they were asking him, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And what did Reginald de Shatzlan do? He became arrogant and said, ask your prophet Muhammad to come to your rescue now. So when Salahuddin heard that he called, uh, he said this about the prophet Sallallahu he said, now I vow to kill him a second time. So he comes and then he said that I will avenge Muhammad upon thee. And he drew his sword and he killed him that moment. When the king saw him, the king began to tremble and shake. And so Salahuddin Ayyubi rahmatullahi he did what? He told the king, don't worry. That this is, is not the custom that kings kill kings. Mean that what? I had a score to settle with this one. This one, there was an issue from the way he had disrespected our deen and our Prophet Finally, after the battle of Hittin, their sights were sent on Jerusalem. You know, we're in a time today where Jerusalem is going through so much oppression. I don't want to be political, but we cannot turn a blind eye to the fact that we have our Muslim brothers and sisters who are being, uh, who, who are being uh, oppressed. They're being attacked. They're being killed. And I'm not saying all Jews are bad. Don't get me wrong. But the Israeli government are, is doing things that we consider to be crimes against humanity, even based on non-Muslim law. They're violating international law. And the world turns a blind eye. And sometimes we lose hope when we see this. But we have to read this and see that things like this happened in the past as well. And Allah Ta'ala gave victory and gave favor to the Muslims. So he had wished and wished and wished for and made dua that Allah would give him Jerusalem. And uh, Ibn Shaddad writes that the Sultan was so keen for Jerusalem that the hills would have shrunk from him, bearing the burden he carried in his heart. On the 27th of Rajab, 583, some of the scholars say the 27th of Rajab is what? The year, the, the, the night the Prophet went to the Isra and Mi'raj, where he visited uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa, namely the Dome of the Rock, then went to the heavens from there. After 90 years, this is this is what it means to be patient and wait for Allah's decree. You know, Allah's decree doesn't have to happen on our timeline. Oh Allah, I, I stopped my haram business. I started a halal business. Why aren't you helping me out? Well, you've been engaged in the haram business for 30 years. You started the halal business three days ago. It, it's not going to happen overnight. Allah will test. He will see, are you sincere? Are you making the effort of something? You to turn back. Allah will look at all these things. 90 years. This, now the, um, uh, he comes back. 
And he comes into um, Jerusalem, and Ibn Shaddad, he writes the following. It was the victory of victories. A large crowd consisting of scholars and the nobles, traders and the laity had gathered on this joyous occasion. A number of people had come from the coastal lands upon news of Sultan's victory, and nearly all the notable theologians from Egypt and Syria came to congratulate him on his victory. Hardly a noteworthy pers uh, person of the empire was left behind. The, joy sh the joyful shouts of Allahu Akbar and La ilaha illallah went through the skies. After 90 years, finally Jumu'ah prayer was held in Jerusalem again. The cross that was put on top of the Dome of the Rock was pulled down. It was an indescribable event as it was. And the blessings and help of Allah were witnessed everywhere on that day. Nuruddin Zangi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he had, um, had, he wanted to conquer Jerusalem. And he had ordered the construction of a very beautiful and ornate uh, a pulpit to be brought into Jerusalem once it's conquered, but he passed away. So Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi, devout to the one who gave his father freedom and gave him an opportunity, what does he do? He now orders that this be brought from Halab all the way to uh, Masjid al-Aqsa into the Dome of the Rock. Now subhanAllah, Salahuddin rahmatullahi alayhi, you would think this victory would make someone feel proud and arrogant and think that look what I did. It was the opposite. We know of a great conquering in our history. This is the Fath of Mecca. The Prophet them came. His head was so lowered that his beard was touching his horse. And he was humbled upon this. And he did not take credit himself. Salahuddin Rahmatullah on that day, his humility, his, 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 his magnanimity on that day has been documented by a non-Muslim who writes, Never did Salahuddin show himself greater than those, greater than during the memorable surrender. His guards, commanded by responsible emirs, kept order in every street. Remember what happened 90 years ago? They came, they, they killed people, and they, they burnt the Jews alive, and they took the Muslims and they slaughtered them. They took the babies and they smashed their heads on the wall until they broke open and blood everywhere. Now the opposite. It's Salahuddin's turn. What will he come? Will he, what will he do when he comes in? Will he do the same and say, you brought knee, blood to the knees of the horses, I'll bring it to their, their waist, their neck? No, the opposite. His guards, commanded by responsible emirs, kept order in every street and prevented violence and insults in so much that no ill use of the Christians was ever heard of. Every exit was in his hands and a trusty Lord was set over David's gate to receive the ransoms as each, city, as each citizens came forth. Then we see what? Um, um, Salahuddin said to his officers, my brother has given his charity. His brother, uh, um, uh, he, he came and he set free 1,000. Um, after describing how the people, um, uh, um, he set free 1,000 slaves. So Salahuddin said that, my brother made his like charity and um, and, and and the other uh, noblemen have made theirs basically, sorry, I think just time is catching up to me. Maybe I should take a nap after this. Um, he was saying that the generals and the lead, he, they all came and showed a display of generosity. One person's generosity is what? Th these many captives, I free them. This many slaves, I free them. They were celebrating their victory, not by harming or pillaging or plundering, but by showing generosity to people. That's what they were doing. So Salahuddin now said, my brother made his charity. Now I make mine. And he ordered his guards to proclaim through the streets of Jerusalem that all the old people who cannot pay the jizya, the tax of, uh, of living in a Muslim land, no problem, you're free to go. And then they came from, um, they came from, I mentioned lo location, and they're going, like they decided to leave. They could stay if they want, but if they leave, they can leave. Those who decide to leave without being touched or harmed by any of the guards or soldiers, they left, it took so long for them to leave, that so many people left without being harmed, that night fell. Night fell, 
And so thus the Muslim showed, he says Saracens, mercy to the fallen city. One recalls the savage conquest by the first creators in 1099, when Godfrey and Tancred rode through streets and choked with the dead and dying, when defenseless Muslims, as he mentioned, were tortured, burnt, and shot down in cold blood on the towers and roof of the temple, when the blood of wanton massacre, wanton massacre defiled the, the, the honor of Christendom and stained the scene for where once the gospel of love and mercy had been preached, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy, was a forgotten beatitude. When the Christians made shambles of the holy city, fortunate were the merciless for they, they obtained mercy at the hands of the Muslim sultan. The greatest attribute of heaven is mercy, crown of justice, and the glory where it may kill with right to save pity, with pity. If the taking of Jerusalem were the only fact about Salahuddin, it were enough to prove him the most chivalrous and great-hearted conqueror of his own and perhaps any era. And Salahuddin Ayyubi, it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. This was the second crusade. The third crusade came. And they tried to attack again now with uh, Frederick Bar Bar Barbosa and, uh, uh, and Richard Lionheart now coming forth and, uh, and, and trying to attack. And Salahuddin, he kept firm. And they kept struggling in this battle. And Salahuddin, um, you know, they, they did come to negotiation. And he said that this one region will be, belong to the Christians, but the rest will remain with the Muslims. In Salahuddin it's described that the holy war was over. The five years contest ended before the great victory of at Hittin in July 1187, not an inch of Palestine west of the Jordan was in the Muslim hands. After the peace of Ramla in September 1192, the whole land was theirs except a narrow strip off the coast of Tyre to Jaffa. Salahuddin had no cause to be ashamed of the treaty. The Franks indeed retained most of what the Crusaders had won, but the result was contemptible in relation to the cost. At the Pope's uh, appeal, all Christendom had risen to arise, and he just speaks about the Pope was encouraging them to go and fight for the sake of Christ, and then they would, you know, do all these things to to encourage everyone. Regardless, Salahuddin he never backed down, and you know, battle. If anyone works out three or four days straight without a rest day, they feel fatigue. At the end of Ramadan, we're looking forward to fasting. We feel some fatigue. He would barely eat. He would barely sleep. He was engaged in worship and uh, to Allah Ta'ala asking for victory. He was too overwhelmed by what's happening to even consume things. And despite that, he continued to fight and he continued to, to, uh, to, to, to push away all those who tried to reconquer Muslim lands. And Allah Ta'ala granted him that victory. However, Everything of greatness must come to an end. On the 27th of Safar, 589, Salahuddin, the friend of Islam, died in the 57th year of his life after working his way up to the summit of his ambition. He reached what he wanted to do. And though he was only 57, now look how he passes away. I know I'm over, so we'll just keep the dua very short today. You can make your own dua at your own time, no problem. Look how he passes away. Ibn Shaddad writes, It was in the night of the 27th of Safar, in the 12th day since he fell ill, that the Sultan's illness took a serious turn. He had become too weak by then. Sheikh Abu Ja'far, the Imam of the Kalasa Madrasa, a pious and saintly person, was requested to stay within the castle during the night so if the Sultan was to breathe his last, he might be, be available for recitation of Quran at that last moment. It appeared as if the time for the Sultan's internal rest was drawing near. Abu Jafar was sitting beside him, reciting Quran, while a certain lay, the Sultan lay unconscious for three days, regaining consciousness only for a few moments and then going unconscious again. When Sheikh Abu Jafar recited the verse um, that he is Allah, who Allah, there's no God but he, la ilaha illahu, alimun ghaybi was shahada, the, uh, the knower of the invisible and the visible, the Sultan, Salahuddin opened his eyes. He, is, he smiled and his face lit up. And he said, Hada Sahih, that this is correct. And when he said this, he passed away. SubhanAllah, what a death. What a death. You know, it's written about him 
that when he could not go and pray with the jama'ah, that he was had an imam assigned within his home who would lead him in jama'ah prayer because he did not want to lose the, the reward of praying in jama'ah. And so on the 27th of Safar, he passes it away. The day of his death was for the Muslims a misfortune that they had never, uh, they never suffered since they were deprived the first four khulafa. The fort, the city, the entire world seemed to weep over his death. Whenever I was told earlier that people longed to offer their own lives in place of others, I thought it was just a figure of speech. But I learned on that day, the, the day the Sultan died, that it could really happen. For I myself was one of those who would have gladly given up his life had it been even slightly possible for the Sultan to have been saved. Now, how much wealth did he die with? Because, you know, he conquered all this land. You can imagine how much wealth he amassed. Ibn Shaddad writes that nothing was left with him except for one dinar and 47 dirhams. He left nothing in houses, nothing in property, nothing in gardens, nothing in village villages. In fact, he had so little that they could not, it would not even pay for his own burial expense. And they had to take a loan out for this. And so this was Salahuddin Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And it's mentioned that he was devout in his deen. He performed his, uh, his practices regularly. Uh, it's written about him. I have not performed a single congregational prayer alone for the past several years. And this, he's in the battlefield. Um, um, what else? He said, mentioned that even though he was king, he never was, uh, he never had to give zakah his whole life. He was king. And he was never, uh, never had to give zakah his whole life because he was so generous. That whenever money came from him, he gave it away. He never had to give zakah. He kept all of his fasts of Ramadan. And uh, before his last illness, um, he had some makeup fast that he had to make up because of previous illness. And so his physician told him that, look, don't fast now. This is not a good time. He said, no, I don't know when death will overtake me. So he, uh, he, he, he made up those fasts even at that point. He never got to perform hajj. He wanted to perform Hajj, but he couldn't because he was so busy protecting the Muslim Ummah. He loved to read Quran and listen to Quran. When he used to listen to Quran, he used to listen to it with focus. And you could see tears flow down his face and down his cheeks. He also used to love to listen to Hadith. If ever a scholar came in, he would go himself. He wouldn't call the scholar to him. He would go himself. And he would sit in the gathering and, and listen to hadith and he would flow, he would begin to weep. And, you know, it's just so much to, to be said about him. But, you know, there's just never enough time. And so this was Salahuddin Rahmatullahi Alayhi. May Allah have mercy upon him and mercy upon us for having lost such a great individual. There's an interesting story I want to share over here. On one occasion, um, there was a there's a, a Christian woman who had lost her child. She said it was stolen by some robbers. So she came to the Sultan and she began to tell him that, you know, some people came, they robbed her tent and they took the baby as well. And she was crying and, and, and she needed help getting the baby back. And Sultan, the Sultan, 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 he was so touched by this. He began to cry. You know, he has so many things to worry about. Why worry about this? He begins to cry. And he tells all of his men um, uh, to go search to where the baby was. After a while, they found the baby. They gave it back to the mother. She came, fell into sajda. And um, um, uh, out of gratitude. But this is just like how he cared for everyone. Didn't matter if she was non-Muslim. Didn't matter that, you know, he's busy with other things. He had to care for everyone. And when you take 
you know, care of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will take care of you. Allah will take care of you. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد بارك وسلم ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكن من الخاسرين ربنا لا تؤاخذنا ان نسينا او اخطانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا اسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقه لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا انت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم اجرنا من النار اللهم اجرنا من النار اللهم اجرنا من النار يا مجير يا مجير يا مجير اللهم انا نسالك العفو والعافيه اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم اجعلنا من اعتقاء شهر رمضان اللهم تقبل عبادتنا اللهم تقبل عبادتنا في شهر رمضان وقبل رمضان وبعد رمضان اللهم اكتبنا مع الشاهدين ومع المحسنين ومع المقربين اللهم اكتبنا مع التوابين اللهم ش... اللهم اكتبنا مع المتطهرين اللهم اكتبنا واجعلنا من اوليائك اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وانت خير الراحمين Oh Allah, we ask that you shower your choices and most special blessings and praise and prayers upon the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Allah, and upon his companions and upon those who followed his way until the end of time. Oh Allah, namely, we ask that you shower these individuals about whom we've discussed or will be discussing, Ya Allah, over the past and into the next day, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, bless them and, and, and enumerate their, their and, 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 and illuminate their graves, Ya Allah, and expand it as far as the eye can see, Ya Allah. Reward them an abundant reward that never comes to an end, Ya Allah. And let us be amongst them, Ya Allah, in action, in spirit, in word, in faith, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to make us amongst those whose souls and spirits have been revived through their example, Ya Allah. And the example of the Prophet, Ya Allah, and the example of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, let us leave this month of Ramadan with souls and spirits that have been revived, Ya Allah. Let us be revitalized and ready to fight shaitan and fight uh, our nafs, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, this last night of Ramadan, Ya Allah, make it a night better than all the other nights that we have spent this Ramadan, Ya Allah. Make our worship more complete and accepted than all the nights of Ramadan, Ya Allah. This day of Ramadan that's coming up, Ya Allah, make it the best day of Ramadan for us, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, oh Allah. One of uh, one of the the brothers, uh, two of the brothers, Ya Allah, who listen every night here or the nights over here, Ya Allah, uh, Owais Malik and Imad Malik, their father, Freed Uncle, Ya Allah, he suffered a ruptured aorta today, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, he was rushed uh, and flown by a helicopter, Ya Allah, to to, uh, to to have an emergency surgery. Oh Allah, we ask that you grant him complete cure, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask that you grant him complete cure and recovery, Ya Allah. Let him come back from this better than he ever was before, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, grant the family ease in this difficult time, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, oh Allah, uh, one of the one of the brothers within uh, one of the ulama in our community, Mali Yusuf, Ya Allah. Both of his parents uh, are, are are fighting cancer right now, Ya Allah cure their cancer completely ya allah and grant them complete recovery ya allah and oh allah uh, reward and bless all of those that i've mentioned right now ya allah with complete forgiveness due to the pain that they have undergone ya allah and let them never face a catastrophe after this ya allah or any calamity after this ya allah or any difficulty after this ya allah oh allah different duas have come ya allah request for duas duas for the children to become pious duas for the individuals here to 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 become steadfast and and, and istiqama oh allah whatever dua has come to us ya allah oh allah please accept that dua ya allah in the greatest form accept of acceptance ya allah oh allah we sit here in these virtual massages with these virtual programs because the doors to your homes are closed ya allah Oh Allah, remove this, remove this COVID from us, Ya Allah, so we can safely and and without any 
harm come back to your homes, Ya Allah, without any difficulty, without any harm, without any infection, we can come back and worship you, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, for so many years we had abandoned your homes, Ya Allah. And now that it's gone from us, Ya Allah, we see our mistake, Ya Allah. Forgive us for our heedlessness, Ya Allah. Forgive us for our laziness, Ya Allah. Forgive us for thinking, I'll go tomorrow. Now tomorrow has come and we can't go anymore, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, attach us back to your homes, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, all those things we've lost out, out as uh, that we should have benefited from in this time of COVID, Ya Allah. Let us, when this time leaves, Ya Allah, be so engaged and involved that we are able to make up for lost time, Ya Allah. Let us visit family more than ever before. Let us uh, let us go to masjid more than ever before. Let us perform hajj and umrah more than ever before. Let us do those things that please you, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask your forgiveness, Ya Allah. Your Prophet ﷺ has mentioned destroyed is that individual that Ramadan comes and leaves and they are not granted forgiveness, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we don't know if we'll be granted forgiveness, Ya Allah. The days of forgiveness are gone, Ya Allah. The days of mercy are gone, Ya Allah. We're at the time, Ya Allah, where these are the days of the people who have now become bound to the hellfire, Ya Allah. That they are now seeking, they are now seeking to be saved from hell, Ya Allah. We are seeking to be saved from hell, Ya Allah. Save us from hell, Ya Allah. Save us from the hellfire, Ya Allah. Save us from the punishment of the grave, Ya Allah. Save us from the fitting of Dajjal, Ya Allah. Save us from the trials of the end of time, Ya Allah. Save us from the evil within ourselves, Ya Allah. Save us from anything and everything of harm, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, over this past year, this past Ramadan, this past year, Ya Allah, so many loved ones have left this world, Ya Allah. People have lost their parents, their siblings, their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents, their children, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, oh Allah, their nephews, their nieces, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, if anyone of us have lost anyone, Ya Allah, let their passing, Ya Allah, be a blessing for them, Ya Allah. Let them be given a grave of a Jannah in their grave, Ya Allah. And allow us to be reunited with them in Jannah the Firdaus, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, all those who recited Quran, they recited the last Tarawih, Ya Allah. Let them all become Hafid of Quran. Whoever recited any Tarawih this year, Ya Allah. And let them become Hamil of Quran, Ya Allah. And let them become those who understand and act upon the Quran, Ya Allah. And let them be raised amongst those individuals, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, do not ever let us forget your Quran, or forget reading your Quran, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, in this month, Ya Allah, we've read more Quran than we normally do, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, let this continue, Ya Allah. Let our deeds continue, Ya Allah. Let us continue to give sadaqah and give charity and do that which pleases you. And be good people, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, make us kind. Allah, soften our hearts so we don't yell at our spouses or our parents or our children or our siblings or any relatives or friends or any. Oh Allah, oh Allah, we turn to you, Ya Allah, and we request your happiness, Ya Allah. We beg your forgiveness, Ya Allah. 
and we seek your pardon, Ya Allah. Whatever is good that we should have asked, that we forgot to ask, Ya Allah, we ask that you establish it for us, Ya Allah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka min khayri ma sa'alaka minhu nabiyuka abduka Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa na'udhu bika min sharri musta'adu minhu nabiyuka abduka Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam antan musta'an wa alaykan balag wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri qanqihi sayyidna Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya Allah. Hamza, what's the plan for tomorrow? 6.45, inshallah. Okay. So our last session will be 6.45 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, we'll cover Izzuddin bin Abdul Salam tomorrow, and then we'll have sort of a Ramadan ikhtitami dua. Don't worry, we'll end before iftar. That way you can sit with your families and make dua with your families as well, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, we should announce uh, about the Eid program as well, right, Hamza? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so go ahead, give the details. I mean, you could post a flyer on the screen somehow. Is that possible? Uh, inshallah, if uh, everyone could tune in to mazusman.org, um, there's information about the Eid live stream, inshallah, on Sunday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, we have Tarawat and Nasheeds and a book reading. And then also we'll have a Eid parade uh, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Masjid location off of Roosevelt Road, inshallah. Jazakum khairan subhanallah bihamdi subhanakum bihamdi shallallahu alayhi wa sallam